Thank you very much. I don't know if you are used, if you are experienced with PCP, in case uh, you can interrupt, ask for clarification. But may I ask if you have experience in participating in European PCP project? Nash. Okay. Uh, let's see, because now I would like to very short and describe the legal framework defined, introduced, and reinforced uh, through the new directive that has been transposed in European countries. So I can provide, evidently, an update of the legal framework. Um, the PCP is exempted from European Procurement Directive. This doesn't mean that these PCP isn't a procurement and is something else. So there is a significant difference between PCP, that is a procurement, in regard, and thanks to the opportunity to clarify, the SBIR mechanism, that is a founding system that found directly the companies, now through a procurement accordingly with the procurement law. So PCP is a procurement that has to be conducted in an open, transparent, non-discriminative way, respecting not only the principle, but something more that is described and included, incorporated in the legal formulation of this exemption. And this legal formulation of the exemption is just a way to to represent the economic rationale of this mechanism to procure R&D in legal words. But we try to see what are the economic determinants of this powerful instrument. The directives say that directives are applicable when the two conditions, A and B, are respected. So, because PCP is exempted, these two conditions together are not applicable in PCP. Indeed, PCP is exempted. So, this means that PCP happen when the benefit do, do not accrue exclusively to the contracting authority for its own internal use. This means that the market that the procurer are designing, are creating, are preparing through this action is wider than the market they are representing. This has implication. What is the implication? The implication is that is necessary a wider clinical validation of the need because the PCP is not for a specific customized need in legal terms. This means that it's not an exclusive based contract because the contracting authority is not asking for research and development services to develop a solution that is so customized to solve a specific need, but is potentially standard, standard, standardizable for create and a wider market at the European level. So um, PCP is a contract, is a procurement contract of R&D services. These R&D services are determined to create benefits for a larger market. As a consequence, because condition B is a consequence of the uh, condition A, the service Provided, provided isn't wholly remunerated in PCP. Why isn't wholly remunerated? Because there is not this exclusive based condition. If I ask a research and development services for my own use, for a very customized contract, I can ask the exclusive of these R&D service. But this is not the case. This is not the economic rationale. P 
PCP wants is aimed to create new markets, giving assigned the companies, the industries, the full capability to exploit commercially, commercially exploit the innovation, selling and reselling the solution in the market, in the European market. So there is, in this sense, a cooperation in this sense, there is a cooperation between the buyer groups and the, the market in defining uh, a challenge that enabled the creation of this market, that opened this market, and give the real concrete possibility for companies, also newcomers, new players, and uh, not traditional players in the sector, to affirm their leadership in this new market. So, uh, I have clarified that PCP is a procurement and not a founding mechanism. And so, PCP doesn't constitute state aid. And if PCP is defined, designed accordingly with the communication 799, we are sure that is state aid free. Because the, um, the new state ad legal framework clari clarify the circumstances according with PCP and any procurement of research and development uh, services, it doesn't constitute state ad. The first condition is that one. The condition is that the procurement does not give any of the participant providers in the, PC, in the research and development contract any preferential treatment in the supply of commercial volumes of the final product and our services to a public purchaser in the member state concerns. This means, this was represented, if we, I can come back to the slide that you presented, Rosana, just to see that was included in, the, in this picture. You see that PCP is the gray part of the process that ends up with the phase three, meaning the experimentation, the testing of a limited volume of first tests. That th this does mean that are industrialized product, but are prototype. The, the phase of procurement of commercial solution is out of the scope of the PCP, is this part in white. So the PCP is not a commitment also to buy the solution, and the conformance testing could be done in PPI. Is not an anticipation, I think is a public domain to know that uh, European Commission has project to launch a call for founding the PPI related to this topic that anti superbugs is addressing. So, uh, in any case, there are two separate procedures, and the kind, a part of the innovation process could be finalized in this part of the uh, procedure. It's important here to have an, a testing in an operational context, meaning an hospital setting and uh, situation. So, so, oh, sorry, so sorry. Sorry, <laughs> part, part of the efforts that we are doing that to define our challenge briefs with functional requirements, needs and functional requirements, they don't enter in any kind of technological specification, just the boundaries like uh, integration with our uh, hospital information system, but these are uh, standard requirements to integrate. Not, we are not saying what kind of technology we want is key because this will allow us with the same challenge brief to move on on the PPI. Okay, so this will allow us then to move on with the same uh, uh, aspect because then we will, will have already prototypes, so we, we are close to the market, still not, not product, that comply with our needs. And so we can move on with the PPIs. 
That is important to say that here the competition is reopened because we can know what will happen on the market in these three years, I don't know how many years, where PCP will be conducted. And to create and enforce the competition, and again, is an economic determinant, as you see, the legal provisions say that no benefit, no advantages is assigned to companies that has participated to PCP for the acquisition of the commercial uh, supply. Here the market will be reopened and procurers will be able to select uh, interesting uh, uh, projects, eventually also developed completed, make uh, evoluted uh, by the suppliers that has not succeed in the uh, link between phase one and phase two. Do not, there is nothing that excludes the possibility for supplier A that has not be, uh, has not successful completed the phase one and so is not invited to bid for phase two to complete their research, to continue the research. And this, in the practice, happened. In the European practice, we had cases of suppliers that, even if they have exit from the PCP phase, they continue the research and they are perfectly aligned and in line to bid for the PPI. So there is a real and a, a competitive uh, mechanism uh, that makes significantly different this approach from the founding system. Uh, we were there, so no preferential treatment for the PPI, let's see. This means that we have to verify in our PCP contract that at minimum 50% of the value of this PCP is dedicated to R&D services, means personal costs to conduct research and development. Of course, we can include, we can incorporate in the value of the PCP, the value of these testing uh, uh, series. If our procurers want to prolong the experimentation, want to use and continue the clinical validation, et cetera, et cetera, they can buy. But it's important that this contract is mainly about R&D services. This is what the legal framework uh, clarify. Then there is a matter related to the price. You remember that we say the PCP is not an exclusive base contract, so, so is not entirely remunerated. This doesn't mean that the procurers will pay a percentage of your offer. They have clearly to pay 100% of your economic offer. This is clear because it's a procurement, it's not a founding. Uh, but the, the price paid has to reflect the market value of the benefits received by the public purchaser and the risks taken by the participating providers and also the benefit assigned to the bidders, to the participant. So because the research and development is not done to, for an, an exclusive use, you will be asked to identify and determine a compensation exactly proportionate to the value of the benefit that you expect to receive, to obtain, thanks to the wider commercialization and exploitation of the IPRs that will be assigned exclusively to you. This means that the procurers will keep the right to use the result, and this is fundamental in your interest, because if they do not keep these results, they will not be entitled and able to procure in a PPI case. So, different is the exploitation. Commercial exploitation is something, an action that is assigned to you because bidders are in the right uh, position to have this uh, full exploitation. So, there are in, in the practice two mechanisms, ex ante, ex post compensation. I think that in a Oh my God, sorry. 
in a European funded project that have a duration will be more and is a cross-border contract that involves seven procurer will be more efficient. This is the idea that I have, the solution that is more applicable in European funded project to opt for a, a double price mechanism that you will see clarifying the call for tender means that you will be asked to make uh, an estimation of the price for, for the specific phase in a theoretical condition of exclusive development. And then you will be asked to make an evaluation of the compensation you want to, you think to, to be able to achieve, and so to make an offer that consider the situation uh, regulated by the contract. So determine these rebates based on the situation of exclusive development. In an exclusive development, a, a, a procurer pay two things, two elements, the market price for R&D services and the market price for the IPRs. In an exclusive base, you have two components of the price. But if the project, the, the procurement is not exclusive base contract, the procurers want to pay and have to pay accordingly the regulation, only the price market, the market price for the R&D services and not the value of the IPRs that remain to you. So the point is to estimate this component, this value of the IPRs. You know, okay, so you have to uh, formulate to price, a theoretical price in case of um, exclusive development and the price. But for sure, being this a uh, procurement, you will pay 100% of the offer you will bid. The last uh, condition, uh, the final condition to exclude state ad, are that the challenge the, of the market, the, the procurement is conducted in an open, transparent, non-discriminatory way, as uh, we have already, and we are doing indeed, where there will be open market consultation across Europe to disseminate widely the, this possibility and also to enable you to create the right consortium, cross-border, eventually cross-border consortium, to create this competition and this uh, solution at the European level. Uh, as the picture has clearly shown, the procurement, PCP, according with the communication 799 of European Commission, is a step-wide process. This is very useful because these keep competition going uh, during the execution of the innovation performance and the R&D services is there are intermediate evaluation uh, for the solution that I the companies will be able to, to present and to select progressively the best solutions. And is a multiple sourcing contract because as you see, there are many bidders in phase one, two, three that will compete in uh, and define the solution. There is an effort that arises exactly from the economic determinants covered by a legal framework to create a, a wider market to uh, achieve, to address through the procurement, the interoperability and product and interchangeability between alternative solution under development. Because here the dimension, the cross-border dimension is key. It's not a secondary element. So we need to address, and you will be challenged companies in this direction to assure interoperability and interchangeability of the solution in different countries. And as Rosanna has anticipated, the, the rationale, again, economic rationale in the research and development contract is to be sure that the procurement um, channel are open and competitive. So in the research and development uh, part, we can close the market to one or uh, single uh, bidders can, can eventually lock in the market. We need to be sure to create, uh, to keep the competition to, uh, before and to assign very competitive contract also through the 
follow up PPI. These are the conditions. I think it's not so, uh, if you have questions are important, I think it's not so key to describe the open market consultation now because we have uh, done this exercise or, or could be important, then we can listen your question and we will be happy to answer to your, your question. It's important that um, market consultation aims is to uh, check the state of the art uh, at the moment to be sure that because we need to validate the assumption for PCP. PCP is an R&D contract, so we need to assess the existence of the mark on the market of an innovation gap. So if you say that the, the solution we are, we are looking for exists on the market, we need to uh, uh, increase the challenge, the ambitious of the project, be more challenging and challenging with the request. Okay, we need to uh, consider the horizon, time horizon, through the exercise that Jean-Patrick has proposed. This was the aim to understand what is the horizon, time horizon to achieve this result, the feasibility of this result. Um, uh, we would like to analyze the operational context where innovation will be introduced and the requirement to fix and describe this context. And you have indeed provided some insight, some, some key issue to be defined. And this open market consultation wants to be also an opportunity for bidders to meet each other, to network, to make a networking and to fit, uh, fit for purpose consortium, the creation of fit for purpose consortium. Uh, in this phase, you are not entitled or expected to submit tenders, proposal, ideas in this stage. We are more focused on what is available or ready to be available in, on the market. Uh, who have not uh, participated to the open market consultation is not penalized because this is not pre-qualification exercise, not a selection exercise. Uh, so no privilege. Uh, the competitive phase, as, as being clearly stated, will be will start when the call for tender will be published. Um, okay, uh, okay, and that's that's all. <laughs>